Today we're going to begin with a question to get our juices running for the topic to be considered. Supposing I ask you this question, if you had to give one criterion and one criterion only to judge whether someone was a mature Christian or not, what would you choose? It's a a lot harder question than it at first sounds. You might say something like person of prayer, maybe person who's loving, somebody that goes to worship every week, maybe even somebody who exercises good stewardship. Those would all be good things, but what interests me is what the New Testament says in answer to that question. It's a section of Hebrews chapter 5 at the end. I'm going to start reading at the 13th verse of Hebrews 5. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a child. But solid food is for the mature. This is verse 14 of chapter 5. For those who have their faculties trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. The simplest way to answer my question is to use Jesus' own phrase. They have a God-based heart. Jesus uses a phrase in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. It's as simple as this. Do you see appearance? Do you see what you want to see? Do you see what you think you see? Or do you see reality? Do you see what God sees? It's a very, very hard thing to see what's going on in front of you and understand not the appearance of it or what you want to see, but the reality of what God is doing in the world. And one of the most striking aspects of Jesus' own ministry is he is the truth. He lives the truth. There is no distance in his own life between appearance and reality. But he also, in every situation, is able to discern and see the distance and the difference between appearance and reality. Let me read you an interesting part of John's Gospel where he speaks to this. Since we're considering 1 John, I thought I'd read this to you today. It's at the end of John chapter 2, and it's a lovely description of our Lord that's not often noticed because it's in a section of John's Gospel where the focus is elsewhere. It's actually the last sentence of the second chapter, but it's describing our Lord, and it's right on topic for us. He knew all men, it says, and needed no one to bear witness of man. Now listen to this last part. For he himself knew what was in man. When I see that, I think of this, the scene in 1 Samuel 16, when Samuel goes to Jesse's house to get the person who's supposed to be the next king, and he goes through all the sons, and it doesn't work, and it doesn't work, and Eliab comes out, and he's this huge basketball player-sized person, and he's just gigantic and looks wonderful. But none of the sons, the Lord tells Samuel, no, no, that's not it. And he finally says, after looking at a lot of sons, he says to Jesse, do you, have any, you don't happen to have any other sons, do you? And he, he, he arrives, and he said, yeah, I have another son. He's, you don't want him. He's out with the lions. And, and he, he, of course, goes and meets this son, and it's David. And it's David that ultimately is anointed as, as the next king of Israel. And what 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 says is, For God sees, not as man sees, man sees with the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. And that's exactly what this is saying about our Lord, is when you have our Lord, you have the incarnation of the life that God wants properly lived. And that life sees through appearance to reality. So when he says the eye is the lamp of the body, you can think of it as the eye is the lamp of the soul if you want. Having the eyes of God to see as God sees is one of the deepest measures of Christian maturity. Paul says that the eyes of our hearts might be opened in one of his letters. Now I want to I drive home the importance of this before we get to 1 John because this is the subject at hand in chapter 4 as it opens and John's writing to his readers. So I want to give you two examples of this. What we're talking about is the Christian challenge for discernment. This is, a, this is a teaching about Christian discernment. And I want to give you two examples. One's from the Bible and one's from my own uh, life and ministry. And it's the Bible one that I want to, to focus on most especially. And I want to remind you of a story that 
really often is never considered. <laughs> Partly because it's such a strange story and partly because it's, it's about a character that is one of the least appealing in all of Scripture. It's about King Ahab and something that happens during his reign. You may remember that we're in the period of time, if we're talking about King Ahab, when the, the, the nation of Israel has actually got a monarch for the first time. So they have a king that happens in 1000 AD and it starts with Saul and it goes to David and then the kingdom divides under Solomon and you have a northern kingdom that's called Israel, capital city Samaria, and you have a southern kingdom called Judah, capital city Jerusalem. So Israel is divided and, and Ahab is the king of the northern kingdom and so we're in the uh, ninth century BC the 800, so if you want a date to just put yourself somewhere in history, we're somewhere between roughly 870 and 850 BC, okay? And if you b believe most Bible scholars, the, the nation split somewhere around 930 to 922 BC. So we're, we're about a generation and a half post the nation splitting. And Ahab, as you may remember, is, a, is just an awful character. He's the one that has uh, multiple encounters with Elijah. He doesn't come off well. Uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal is under Ahab's reign. Ahab is the one who uh, goes after Naboth and his vineyard, one of the really sad stories in the Old Testament. But this story happens at the very end of the time of Ahab, and it's a story that's all about discernment. And the reason why I want to start with it is it, it, it is a great story it illustrates how hard real discernment really is when you get in crunch time. And where this story intersects with us is you're in a war. And you know, just take yourself back to somebody like Churchill or Eisenhower in the Second World War and plop yourself down with clouds of smoke in the air. You know, the fog of war is a deliberately used phrase. It's confusing to get involved in a war. Well, Ahab and the, the kingdom of Israel has been fighting against Syria, and he's trying to figure out if he should go battle against Syria again. And Jehoshaphat is the king of the southern kingdom, Judah. And, and Ahab in Israel is trying to talk Judah and, and dis discern with Judah whether or not to go to war. And we're in 1 Kings and the 22nd chapter. And so I'm going to start reading at the fifth verse. And remember now the characters. Ahab is the king of the northern kingdom, that's Israel. Jehoshaphat is the king of the southern kingdom, that's Judah. And they're debating uh, an ongoing struggle that Ahab is having with Syria, whether or not together they should go to war against Syria. Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, inquire first for the word of the Lord. Gee, there's an idea. Before you make a decision, actually try to get... God's input. So far, so good. And Jehoshaphat, by the way, just in passing, is, is portrayed as a very, one of the good, faithful uh, king figures in the old uh, covenant history. Then the king of Israel gathered his prophets together, 400, that's a lot, and said, shall I go to battle against Ramath Gilead or shall I forbear? You all see where I am, verse 6. And they said, go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat had an uneasy feeling. We don't know why, but he just, it might have been the way that they said it, uh, the degree of unanimity with which they said it. But he said in verse 7, Is there not any other prophet here? Let's just make sure to get all the input possible. And the king of Israel, notice by this time that the writer of Kings regularly doesn't even refer to Ahab by name because he's such a notoriously bad character. He's just called the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, yes, as a matter of fact, you know, there is one other guy. I'm just going to paraphrase the text for, for our purposes right now. And his name is Micaiah. You don't want him. He never, ever tells me uh, what I want to hear. He's just awful. And uh, Jehoshaphat listens to this and says, well, you know, uh, let, let's not be too hasty. Let's get all the input we can get. So they send for Micaiah. Meanwhile, while they send for Micaiah, these 400 prophets and, and you know, this sort of entourage of prophets, they're arrayed in their robes, they're prophesying, they're putting on horns of iron and, say, and continuing to prophesy what they prophesied initially. So you can just imagine this sort of cacophony of you're going to win, you're going to win, you should go, you should do this. And here's this poor guy, Micaiah, one prophet, right, versus 400 prophets. And they go get him. And uh, <clears throat> Micaiah, verse 14, says, As the Lord lives, 
what the Lord says to me that I will speak. That's what, that's what he says when they come get him. He says, now you guys, you sure you want me because I'm only going to say what God tells me to say. You sure? Because, you know, we, have, we don't have a very good track record here. In terms of, I'm not, I'm not going to pull any punches. And they say, no, the king, no, they, they, Jehoshaphat and Ahab are having this discernment approach. And Jehoshaphat wants all the input. So we want, and you're still part of the deal. So we want you. So he gets called in. <clears throat> and verse 15, and this is a, this is a majestically wonderful Old Testament scene because it's so realistic to the way human life works. Verse 15, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we forbear? And he answered him. Now, if you were ever doing this passage with an acting class, this is the line that you would use to challenge people because the way that this line is said in this story is the pivot on which the whole story turns. Okay, so here's Micaiah, right? Ahab can't stand him. He never hears what he wants to hear. Micaiah gets summoned. He says to the guys who summoned, I'm not going unless you understand. I'm just saying what God says. And they ask Micaiah the same questions that they asked the, all the other 400 guys who've been bending over backwards to say, you should go, you should go, you should go. You need to do this. You're going to win. Okay. And what does Micaiah say? <clears throat> and it goes something like this. Oh, go up and triumph. The Lord will give it to the hand of the king. Right? He says it utterly not believing a word of what he's saying. It's so sarcastic and it's so unconvincing that even Ahab, who can't stand Micaiah, understands what's going on. But, verse 16, the king said to him, How many times shall I adjure you that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Even Ahab as spiritually disastrous a character in the Bible as he is, realizes that he, he's dealing with somebody who's not saying what the Lord has told him to say, and he at least wants him to say what's on his mind, even though he can't stand what he says, and he almost always disagrees with what he says. But he wouldn't say that unless Micaiah said what he said as sarcastically and as unconvincingly as he says it. Okay, so, no, don't, no, don't give me that muckety-muck. You've never done that before. And the only reason you're doing it now is because you consider this whole scene a mockery, which, by the way, he does. So he says to him, essentially, two things. It's an amazing section of scripture, and you can read it at your leisure if you want to. It's a, it's a terrific story. He says, basically, you're going to lose. And then he goes even further than that, and he says, I saw a lying spirit, and the lying spirit inspired uh, spiritual work in such a way that the lying spirit would inspire false prophets to prophesy in such a way as to convince you that you wouldn't lose. So not only does he say the king is going to lose, but he, he says that all of the other people who've spoken are lying because they're inspired by a spirit of lying, which, by the way, is not a good way to win friends and influence people to quote Dale Carnegie. Okay, and the king, of course, once again, is, is just utterly disgusted. Zedekiah, the son of Kenai, comes near, strikes Mike on the cheek, right? He's sort of the head of this group of 400 prophets. How did the spirit of the Lord go from me to you? And the king of Israel said, seize him, take him back to Ammon, and put him in a prison and feed him hardly anything, bread and water, until I come in peace. Basically, he gets trashed. He gets trashed by the head of the 400 prophets. He gets thrown in prison and offered almost nothing to eat and drink uh, by the king until he comes back. And Micaiah's last line in this incredible scene is, if you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. Now you can see where I'm going with this. This is a great scene. And remember, this is only happening because Jehoshaphat has asked Ahab, hey, let's make sure we get all the input. Have I heard from everybody? And he says, well, yeah, there is one more prophet. It's, it's, it's a bit like Jesse's sons. Yeah, well, I actually do have another son, but you don't want him. Well, I do have another prophet, but you don't want him. He never... Well, you get all the input. But the question is, do you believe 400 or do you believe one? And there are situations where the one is right and the many are wrong. Just because it appears that the numbers are in favor of something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very interesting scene. Now, you know what I'm going to tell you happened. He takes the advice of the majority. He goes into battle and he's killed just exactly like Micaiah says, the reason why I'm telling you this story is this is the question you and I have to ask ourselves when we read a story like this. If I were Jehoshaphat or Ahab, 
and I had to make this decision, what would I do? And if you think it would be easy to listen to my kai, you need to think again. <laughs> if, you, if you have 12 people giving you advice and 11 say one thing and one says the other and you go with the one, that is a courageous and gutsy thing to do, but you better be sure. But you can't be doing that based on appearances. It's got to be based on reality. That's a story about appearance and reality, and they can be really different. One other quick story, and then we'll go on. This is a story from my own ministry, <clears throat> and I don't know if you feel the way I do, but I've often said that the Episcopal Church's lay people are one of the greatest feeding grounds for false Christian teaching in the world. If you are a cult and you want a place to recruit from, what you want is the children of Episcopalians. Usually, they don't know their faith. Usually, they haven't passed it on to their children. But they respect the Bible and the Christian tradition enough to know that they should know a lot about it. And so, you can use the tools of Christianity in such a way as to get false doctrine across. And most Episcopalians won't know it's false doctrine because even though they respect the source, they don't know enough about the contents of the source. And that's exactly what happened in the parish I previously served in Somerville. There was a, a family, um, and they had a couple of children who were sons, and they went away to college, and they got involved in a, in a cult, a Christian cult, which is called the Way International. And I'm just going to read you very briefly about this cult. I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but the reason why I want you to hear this story is these are children of Episcopalians. This just happened uh, just a few decades ago now. And they, they got involved in this cult because the Bible was used, false teaching was given to them, and it sounded really plausible. Now this is just a bit about the way. The way rejects the Trinity and teaches that unlike God, Jesus is not omniscient, omnipotent, or omnipresent. According to their ministry, Jesus did not exist before his birth except in the foreknowledge of God. The way teaches that at his birth, God created the sperm to fertilize Mary's ovum, and is the literal father of Jesus. The founder of the way, who's a guy named Victor Paul Weirville, actually writes in his book, Receiving the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is a reference to God rather than a separate entity or person. So they're non-Trinitarian. But what's so uh, incredibly frustrating about them is, early on in their ministry, when you get welcomed in and when they do their initial teaching, none of that is apparent. That comes in later. And by the time it comes in, most of the people who are in are people like these young men who got involved in the way, they came back to Somerville and actually got other parishioners involved in the way. And the reason why I'm telling you that story is the discernment that's required, that's talked to in a story like the story about Micaiah and Ahab, the king of Israel, that level of discernment is also required for us. I don't know what false teaching is going to assault you, but I know that there will be false teaching that will assault you. And you have to be equipped to know how to discern truth from error. You need to pray for the gift of discernment. You need to ask God to mold you and shape you like clay in his hands. And most especially, you need to dare to pray to have the eyes of God, which is a very, very important, but also a very hard thing to get. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. All right, you all with me? So I hope I've sold you on the importance of uh, the, the, the need for discernment. All right, now to 1 John. John's got false teachers in the church. We've seen this all the way through. And in 1 John 4, and just the first six verses, he's after this whole area of be careful, look out, think carefully, make sure that you get it together in the area of judging who is talking to you and whether they're really teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ or something else because they might look like they're Christian, they might sound like they're Christian, but they're actually not. So be careful. That's what John is all about. All right, I'm going to read you from the Revised Standard Version. We're in John, 1 John 4, and we're beginning at the first verse. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. That word test is examine, prove. Uh, you can think of it in a kind of a scientific sense or in the, in the sense of a, of, of a metal that, that smelts the impurities that come to the top when it's boiled at very high temperatures. It's that kind of an idea. It's that level of discernment. So you're going to get things said to you in the context of a Christian community. Now what he's thinking about is something that might make you uncomfortable. It's certainly not 
something we talk much about today, but remember back in the first century church, we have pr the prophecy in terms of the gift of prophecy being exercised in the church. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 14. So people stand up and say, uh, this is a word from the Lord. And Paul goes through in 1 Corinthians 12 and especially 14, uh, a way that you're supposed to go about this. And Paul says, just what John says, make sure to test it. <laughs> Don't just assume because somebody said, this is a word from the Lord, that it is a word from the Lord. But you're in a church where people are actually speaking this way, right? So somebody says, God's spirit inspired me to say X. That's what John's dealing with. And even though that might not be a common experience for us, mm -hmm. it was a common experience in the early church. Don't believe every spirit, make sure to test it. Okay, many false prophets have gone out into the world. We've talked about this before, but just to remind you one more time, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about true prophets and false prophets, right? You will know them by their fruits. Be careful, right? Wolves in sheep's clothing. And I've also taken you to Acts 20 and Paul's speech to the elders in the church of Ephesus when he goes and he says, after me, they're going to come from within your very own number false teachers, and they're going to look good, they're going to sound good, they're not going to be right. You've got to be prepared. So both from Jesus and from Paul, as well as from 1 John, you've got a warning that the kind of discernment that I'm talking about is going to have to be exercised. Okay, so, so far, so good. Now, th what's interesting about this passage is it's only six verses, but it's actually loaded with a lot of interesting stuff in terms of how discernment is supposed to work. And remember, so far as we can figure out, we only have half of a telephone conversation, but those who were once of us but, have not, but are now not of us because they've gone out from us, right? These false teachers that are somehow were in John's community and have now gone out from John's community, right? So they're the ones that John's trying to combat. Remember that they looked good, they sound good, they seem to be good, and John's got people who either followed them or followed their teaching or both, or at least parts of their teaching. And John's writing to a community where that teaching is still there in some way or other. And he wants his readers to be confident, right? We've talked about this before. He wants them to have Christian confidence in their own faith. But this passage is about something else, which is he wants them to be confident in their discernment. Now, what's interesting about it is the pronouns, and this is often missed in this passage. There's actually three people or three groups that are referred to. There's you, verse 4, you are of God. There's they, you see it, verse 5, they are of the world. And then there's a third group, verse 6, we. And it's interesting, John could be accused of being arrogant unless you put yourself in the position of understanding we're dealing with first century apostles. And so they're in, a, they're in a very peculiar and honored place in the history of salvation. They have a peculiar and special role to play. But notice the discernment involves three different groups, right? It has something to do with the apostles. It has something to do with the community to which the apostles are speaking. But it also has to do with the false teachers. And that already sets up a degree of the subtlety of but also the challenge of and the importance of discernment. You always want to see those three things, right? You've got some false teaching, actually the doctrine, right? You have the teaching of the apostles, and then you have the community it's coming into, but you have the vehicle through which it's coming. And all those things matter, right? So you always want to keep those three in mind. And what's so neat about this passage is he's basically trying to tell them to marshal all three, right? We are of God. So, so it has to have some tie to the apostles. Right? And that, again, might sound arrogant to us, but it's not arrogant at all in the first century context because the apostles are the apostles. And to quote the, uh, the Lambeth Conference, to that apostolic authority, the church must ever bow, right? even to this day. They are the ones through whom we have gotten uh, the New Testament itself. And even though the canon is now, so far as we can figure, closed, unless we discover a manuscript that we haven't for 20 centuries, their, their teaching is to be respected, so we is a part of it, but it's also part of it that it has to come to you. And what I want to emphasize for our purposes today is this you is plural. This is why it's good that you're in a Bible study. Discernment is always something that has to be worked out in the body. And one of the ways that good Christian communities can combat discernment is don't let it get into individuals. Make sure to check it out and have it go through the whole body. It's very much harder to deceive a whole church
than it is to deceive an individual or a married couple or even a family. Notice what happened in the story I told you about the way international is. Two sons went away, right? So they, and they were dealt with one-on-one. -on -one. Then they came back to the community. And even early on when they were doing the false teaching in Somerville out into the community, they were doing it in very small doses. But there was no setting in which of the whole church or even the eldership of the vestry of a church or something said, now, okay, let's see what this is. Let's work at it together. So you have an interesting a reminder of the importance of corporate discernment, right? You, I'm going to mess up. My wife's going to help me. She's going to mess up. I'm going to help her. That's one of the things about a good, healthy Christian marriage. A good Christian church is even better than that. So you are of God, right? So you've got a community that's going to help you. We have the apostolic message, right? They sat at Jesus' feet for three years. They were personal eyewitnesses of the resurrection, and they were personally commissioned by Jesus Christ. That's true of no one else in history, just the original 12, right? So, so that's their special apostolic authority. So you've got, to, you've got to test it based on apostolicity, if I can use that word, right? Apostolic authority, right? The apostles' teaching. You've got to do it as you corporately, and you've got to do it in such a way that the doctrinal content is carefully paid attention to. Now this is where it gets interesting. It's very focused, isn't it, on the Incarnation. And this ought not to surprise us because we've had several occasions so far in the series where we've already referenced what probably is at least some of the form of this false teaching, right? It has something to do with the fact that Jesus came in the flesh, but he only seemed to be fully fleshly, right? And just in passing, I hope you noticed, Victor Paul Weirville and the Way International that I just read you about, very similar, very similar to the heresy that John is dealing with. So don't think that this is just ancient. This is not ancient stuff. This is very contemporary. Okay, so what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to test it in the community. I'm supposed to test it against a sense of apostleship. But I'm supposed to test it based on its content. And the content that matters is a complete profession of the fullness of the doctrine of the person and the work of Christ would be, the, would be a simple way to summarize it, but especially for John's purposes, the incarnation, right? Look at verse 2. Every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ not has seemed to come in the flesh, right? Not, not no absolutely confusion of any kind, right? He's brooking no opponents. Jesus really was God. As I like to say, quoting a a Sunday school a child, Jesus is God with skin, right? That just puts it really plainly, right? And that's exactly what these false teachers would never, ever say. So every spirit which can, does not confess Jesus is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, okay? So, so what are they supposed to do? They got this false teaching. They're supposed to say, now, are you really saying that Jesus is fully human and fully God? And in John's case, and of course, heresies, False teachings can vary. We're dealing with a specific one in John's case, but what John is saying is they're messed up on the humanity side, right? They, 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 they're okay with Jesus being God, but he's, he's just not fully human. He seems human. So they're, they, they, they want him to, he kind of touches down in history, but not fully. And, and John's saying, no, you have to be fully, in every possible sense, somebody that believes in the Incarnation. They are of the world, John says. Therefore, what they say is of the world, and the world listens to them. We are of God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and he who is not of God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So you've got a very interesting, simple, uh, maybe even apparently beguilingly simple set of six verses in which you're given a very good instruction about Christian discernment. Test it based on the teaching of the apostles. Make sure to do it with a sense of you corporately, right? So don't, even one or two is not enough. If you're dealing with a book or listening to somebody on tape or watching a video, whatever it is, right? Make sure to trust it. No, make sure not to trust it unless it's properly discerned, right? I, I don't think I've quoted this to you before, but one of my favorite professors in seminary who was from Europe always used to say in theology class, never trust a theologian. Never trust a theologian, by which he meant always go home and check it out. Read, be like the Bereans in the book of Acts, right? Check out the scriptures. Sounds good, seems good, good credentials, looks good, feels good, but be careful, right? Because that's the hard thing about good heresy. Good heresy is very similar to the truth, 
but not the whole truth, and therefore it's not the truth, right? Half the truth masquerading as the whole truth is still an untruth, right? And I've, we've talked before about that incredible challenge of dealing with fire ants, and one of the things that they figured out how to do was to design something that looked like their food, smelled like their food, and they took it into the nest, but actually it was poison, not their food, right? And that's what we're dealing with here. So you need to have these three tests. You've got to look at who it's coming from, what they're saying, and test it against the truth of Christian doctrine. You've got to test against the teaching of the apostles, right? It's got to be apostolic, right? And you've got to test it corporately. That's a very, very important thing. <clears throat> one quote and one more example, and then I'm going to stop for, for now. Um, this is one contemporary Christian writer writing about discernment our topic for today. Just to summarize the, the focus. Discernment in Scripture, Jay Stoll writes, is the skill, notice that fascinating word, skill, it's developed. It's a gift, but it's also developed over time. That enables us to differentiate. It is the ability to see issues clearly. We desperately need to cultivate this spiritual skill that will enable us to know right from wrong. We must be prepared to distinguish light from darkness, truth from error, best from better, righteousness from unrighteousness, purity from defilement, and principles from pragmatics. Those are his words, not mine. That's Jay Stoll's 1986 book, Fan the Flame. Just one good quote from someone who's really worked in this area to give you a sense of the scale of what we're talking about. That's a lot of distinctions that he just laid out. The other thing I wanted to make sure to do is to give you one other example of this Johannine-like false teaching so that you're aware of it. There was a book written in the 70s called The Myth of God Incarnate by a whole series of very well credentialed scholars in England. It caused a huge sensation at the time because, as you can tell by the title, The Myth of God Incarnate, they were in a very serious way going after the truth of the Incarnation. And guess what? What the book is about is they are, first of all, their target audience, they're very clear about this, is Christian disciples. That's who the book is for, right? So, and what they're doing is, for the sake of effective Christian discipleship, we're combating the Incarnation. That was the purpose of this book. That's one of the reasons it causes sensation. I quote two of the authors. One says, Jesus is, and I quote, as if God for me. That's a direct quote from the book. That ought to scare you to death, right? There's a big difference between Jesus is God and Jesus is, is as if God, right? There's, there's, a, there's a subtle line being, being put there, and he's putting the line. That's not a full confession of the depth of the reality of the Incarnation. Here's another one of the writers. <clears throat> Jesus was so powerfully God-conscious that his life vibrated, as it were, to the divine life. Therefore, to encounter Jesus was always a turning point, a crisis of salvation or judgment. Wonderful stuff, right? Powerfully God conscious, had a life vibrating to the divine life. You know, so you get this huge, uh, close identification between Jesus and God. But, 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 right? God consciousness and uh, vibrating divinely as powerful as they are, that's not the same as fully God and fully man. This whole book is a book about heresy. Some other scholars wrote a book called The Truth of God Incarnate, and the, the authors of the book The Truth of God Incarnate actually met with all the authors of the book The Myth of God Incarnate, and as the story goes, the key moment in the conversation was when one of the authors of The Truth of God Incarnate said to the gathered group who wrote the other book, do you worship Jesus, right? They didn't, they're making an opposite error to this group in John. They, they, they are okay with Jesus as an earthly figure. They don't want to fully affirm his divinity. That's where their hang-up is in this book. So the question, do you worship Jesus, is a really piercing question. And it, it met with total silence. There was not a single one of them that could affirm they worship Jesus. And what immediately comes to my mind whenever I think of that story is the incredible scene at the end of John 9, which is the story of the man born blind, when he goes through all these scenes, his parents and the, 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 the powers that be within Judaism, and he just keeps saying, I don't, why are you getting mad at me? I was blind and now I see. And the man, I, I went and did what he said. And, you know, it, it's, it's an incredible, but at the end of it, the man is with Jesus.
and he says, you know, I, you know, what, 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 what am I supposed to do about the Messiah? I who speak to you am he, and he, he falls down and worships him. It's an amazing scene, but, but the power of it is the figure of Jesus has the blind man clearly prostrate at his feet, and he's not recoiling. And if you think about Jesus' humanity at that point, you have to understand, if, if I did that for you, you would recoil. I cannot handle it if somebody gets down and starts worshiping me. It just, it just, the average person recoils at that. Jesus does no such thing. He calmly accepts it. So the question, do you worship Jesus, is a very New Testament-like question. Right? Jesus is Lord, one of the earliest sort of proto-creeds of the Christian church, is a confession of the Lordship of Jesus and a form of worshiping Jesus, right? Curios Christos in Greek, only two words in Greek, three words in English. So what have we said? Uh, we've said, basically in this teaching, two simple things. First of all, uh, discernment is a big deal. Uh, it's a big deal in the Bible, and it's a big deal in the contemporary church. And Christian maturity means you need to become good at discernment. It takes time, it's a skill that's developed, it needs to be corporate, all those things are true, but it's a big deal, right? Jesus tells us it's important, the Bible is all over it as something that's important, and it's clear that John expects his readers to be able to do it. And then we've said in this passage, John basically gives them a three-pronged approach. He wants them to be confident, to say, no, this is not true because this is true. And they can do that because they have a received content of Christian doctrine, they have apostles teaching and apostolicity over here, and they have their own community, which is able to take this, the teaching which is coming from the false teachers into it and say, as a group, you, corporately, we're going to test this. And since it doesn't meet the incarnational truth criteria, and we as a whole don't see it, and this is something that the apostles never teach, right? We, in John's language, never taught this, right? It fails on all three. Therefore, it has to be rejected. And the only difference between them and us is we, can't, we don't have apostles in our midst in the way that they did. We have the apostles teaching. We have a New Testament. So it's a powerful incentive to learn uh, scripture and to learn it well and to be able to use it as a tool for discernment. It's a powerful incentive uh, to pray uh, for the eyes of Christ. And it's also a powerful reminder, this whole area, that it's not simply an ancient problem. <laughs> It happened in Somerville, it happened with the myth of God incarnate, and it's happening right now in the church. So never trust a theologian. Thank you very much.